Good morning, Liberty family. Would you stand with us? Let's worship our Savior this morning. Father God in heaven, we love you so much, and we're so grateful for the privilege to be in your house today to worship you, lift you high, because you deserve our worship, you deserve our praise. Father, we thank you for the privilege to meet in this place, to experience your presence. God, meet with us today, that we may experience the glory of your goodness. Lord, and as your word is presented today, Father, may we be changed by the power of it. Lord, we lift your name on high, and we thank you so much for all that you do for us. And God, we give you the praise. It's in Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's sing. What does it mean to be saved? What does it mean to be saved? Isn't it more than just a prayer we pray? More than just a way to heaven, yeah. What does it mean to be His, to be formed in His likeness? Know that we have a purpose, and here's our purpose. To be soft and light in the world, in the world. To be soft and light in the world. Let the redeemed feather, Lord, say. to be singing out loud right now. Here we go. Let's sing again. Oh, that the church would arise. Oh, that we would see with Jesus' eyes. We could show the world heaven. Yeah. Show what it means to be His. To be formed in His likeness. Show them they have a purpose. To be soft and Soft and light in the world, in the world, it'll be soft and light in the world. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Say so, say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Say so.
a little bit of movement this morning as we worship our King. It's an open heaven that you're releasing And we will never be denied Cause we're stirring up Let me hear you say amen. 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 All you sinners with your Redskins jerseys on and Green Bay jerseys on. I'm Texas Rangers, man. (laughs) I I can't help it. I'm a Rangers fan through and through. We're so glad that you're here in God's house today. Members, thank you for being faithful to God's house. If you're visiting with us, I see some new faces across the crowd. We are so glad that you chose to worship with us today. Members, make our guests feel welcome, would you? We hope you feel right at home here at Liberty. Uh, we love having a great time. I, I love looking around during that song and seeing all of our kids dancing in that song. That's, that's a song they do every Wednesday down in King's Kids, and, uh, man, they love that song. My kids listen to it all the time at home, so I, I get a good taste of it every single week. We got a new set of memory verses, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 and 8 for this month. We didn't have them last week. But we do have them this week. Let's read together 2 Timothy 4, 7 through 8. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. 
Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. And all God's people said, what a great promise in God's word. That ought to motivate us each and every day of our lives. So if you're glad to be in God's house this morning, find someone you said hadn't said hello to yet and tell them you're glad to see them in God's house. Amen. You may be seated as we continue in worship this morning.
Somebody say Jesus.
Jesus, we praise your name today, and we're so grateful for what you've done in our lives. We're so grateful that you chose to leave heaven for a cross. The Bible says you did it for the joy that was set before you. You didn't do it because you had to, because you were forced to. You did it because of your great love for us. Mankind, creation that turned its back on you. Creation that didn't ask to be saved, didn't ask to be redeemed, but yet your love was so great that you chose to leave everything and come to this earth to die for us. Oh, what love. Oh, what wondrous love. And Father, as much as I enjoy singing your praises on this earth, lifting your name, worshiping your name in this place, I can't wait till the day that I stand in the throne room and you walk in and I fall flat on my face. And all that can come out of my mouth is holy, holy, holy. And for all of my days in eternity, I will praise you and lift you high because of what you've done and who you are. Jesus, we feel your presence in this place today. God, those of us who are saved, those of us who have accepted Christ as our Savior, Father, we thank you for what you've done for us. Father, anyone in this room that maybe hasn't accepted the gift of salvation from Jesus Christ, Father, may today be the day, the day that they're converted, that they turn their life around and accept the gift, the free gift that you've given to us. We love you, Jesus. We thank you for your great love for us. We pray that you'd be pleased with everything that we say and do in this place. You speak to us and speak through us. In Jesus' name we pray. All these things. Amen. Shame is a pre- 
I say, Brother Don, mm. the Bible says in that faithful day, dead in Christ will rise first. Now that might describe some of you this morning, but most of you are up and excited to worship the Lord Jesus this morning. And you know what? If you can't get excited in God's house, where can you get excited? Amen? I think about uh, sporting events, and this is kickoff Sunday, and I'm sure many of you have plans to watch your NFL team. Uh, later today, or, you know, like uh, Green Bay, we played uh, Thursday night. But, uh, y- you know, you get excited about that, right? And rightfully so. It's okay to have spirit. It's okay to be excited and passionate about sports. But I tell you what, the one thing that we need to be excited about is our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? And worship of Him. Praise God. You know, the Bible says, The dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever, 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 ever be with the Lord. Amen. Amen. 10,000 years will only just begun, as the songwriter said. Life, just this little speck in time. I've said it often. It determines where we will be in eternity and what we will have in eternity, for all eternity. This little speck in time. I'll tell you what, we need to get excited right now, praising Jesus and getting ready for that faithful day when it comes. Amen. My dear friend, Dr. Ergen Kanner and his lovely wife are our guests this morning. Give them a big hand this morning. I've known, I've known uh, Dr. Kanner for many years now, and he's been a dear friend, uh, a confidant, uh, a source of great wisdom, 
uh, for me as a pastor uh, when, I needed, when I needed somebody to uh, encourage me, when I needed somebody to help me navigate through some uh, difficult waters. Uh, he's always been a, a, a willing ear and someone that's given uh, great godly advice in line with God's word. And, uh, and, and I just, I tell you folks, I fell in love with this guy many years ago, and uh, he's very busy. Uh, he was uh, the uh, president of the Theological Seminary at Liberty University. He's now the president of, uh, I forget the name of, Bruden Parker, Bruden Parker uh, College. And uh, he has also been uh, the Dean of Theological Studies and Master's Work at Liberty, Uni or, excuse me, Arlington Baptist University. And so, uh, and through all of that, he's been a faithful preacher of God's Word, uh, a herald uh, for the truth of God's Word, an apologist. Uh, he can stand and uh, debate the Scriptures with anybody out there, uh, atheists, uh, agnostics, homosexuals. Uh, he's, he stood faithful to God's Word, not his opinion, but God's Word through it all. And folks, I'll tell you, we're privileged to have him here with us today. And so I want you to do me a favor and give my dear friend, Dr. Ergen Canner, a warm liberty welcome as he comes this morning. That's not fair, dude. Um, everything he said about me, he, I could say about him. So that's sort of cheating because that steals, steals anything I was going to say. Uh, Rick Ross has walked with me through some, I mean, dark days. Uh, and, for, and for me to be able to come back here, I believe it was 2012, first time I got to be with y'all. And um, uh, I was on Arlington at that time. By the way, I got to say this before we get started. That may have been one of the greatest special songs I have ever heard in church. And I'm not joking and I'm not kidding. Amen? Oh, oh my Buddha, are you kidding me? That was amazing. Um, do you all know that song? I hope you do. And if you youngins will look right here, that song was the last song that Johnny Cash ever recorded before he died. And as a matter of fact, when Johnny Cash sang that song, you know, he was, at the end of his life, he was feeble, he couldn't stand. They brought the recording instruments into the, be into the, the hospital room. He sang it with a chain, with a small chain in his hand, symbolizing that, you know, he broke our chains. I say that because I got a 15-year-old boy who thinks that all music started with Lil Wayne. <laughs> I also have a 15-year-old boy who tells me that it's not Little Wayne, it's Lil Wayne, and he's hardcore. He tells me Lil Wayne is hardcore because Lil Wayne's been in jail, and thus, He's somehow earned the stripes to be a hardcore singer. And I have to teach my 15-year-old son about guys like Johnny Cash and George Jones. Now look, Lil Wayne may have served time in jail, but George Jones, the possum, tried to outrun the cops on a lawnmower. The man was so drunk that the cops stopped him. It's famous. Look it up on YouTube. He was going to outrun the cops on a lawnmower. That's hardcore. When Willie Nelson's wife caught him doing something Willie Nelson shouldn't have been doing, she sewed him into the bed sheets and almost beat him half to death with a golf club. That's hardcore. Call me next time somebody sews you into the bed sheets. That's what I try to teach, try to carry on. I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. A little confusing this morning. I, I get the honor in Texas of standing up in an Ohio State jersey, and you all have been very kind to me. I say that because I got saved five minutes from OSU, from Ohio State University. A little church where I was, uh, Stells Road Baptist Church, five minutes from Ohio State campus. And so... Um, you know, I'm, I'm sort of a Buckeye. And I walked in with full assurance everything was going to be Texas Tech. And I'm looking around and seeing green, green, nothing could be further from Wichita Falls than Green Bay. And until I saw the Raiders. I, and I, I saw the Redskins. And I'm, y'all are confusing me. Do you understand what I'm saying? And Tampa Bay? 
where's the nearest bay to Wichita Falls? I don't believe there's any kind of bay around here. <laughs> What's so funny, what is so awesome is that there's just a few of you still hanging on. Still got your Cowboys jersey. Yes, yes. You're still hanging on. It may have dust on it. But the, they, they look better than our jerseys because, you know, they aren't used the full season. Y'all are out before the playoffs, and I'm sorry to say. Now, my Buckeyes won, but I will venture to say we're going to find some way to lose in the next couple of weeks. We always lose to the worst team we play. There's something about Ohio State that garners a, a loss against a, I don't know, cosmetology school, a community college. We lose to some ridiculous school every single year. Just prepare for it. You'll see us posting. I'm always posting stuff about, you know, Buckeyes or something, just because it annoys everybody. In our little church, everything is purple. We're from Alito. I got to retire after I had my heart surgeries. I had to retire, and I moved to Alito, Texas. And my pastor, Clark Bozier, good friend of your pastor, um, my pastor doesn't fit. Everything around us is to TCU. Horned frogs, right? Am I saying, somebody else? Okay, horned frogs. I don't know what that is. I have never seen a horned frog. So why don't you all just call yourselves the lizards? It's too easy. Well... Well, I'm glad you said that. I'm glad you said that because my pastor is a Kansas fan. Apparently the only one. I've never met another Kansas fan. I guess. But here's what he says. In the pulpit, he'll get up and go, I hope I say this right. Rock, chalk, Jayhawk. Maybe the stupidest thing I've ever heard anybody say to support their ball team in my life. Rock, I get. You know, throw a rock, I reckon. Chalk? What? And I don't know what a Jayhawk is. I'm a city guy. I, I guess I need to preface that and tell you that because there's a lot I'm going to say that may not confuse you, but just I'm going to set the context. I am a city slicker. I am an immigrant. I am. Born in Stockholm, Sweden. Raised a Muslim from Turkey, my entire family is Turkish, moved to America, lived in Columbus, Ohio. My father built mosques. And so I got saved in Columbus. I have never mowed a yard. I have never fished, never hunted. How many here hunt? I admire you. Y'all who can do that, I think that's an amazing thing. Don't understand why y'all do it at 4 a.m. in the morning. Makes no sense to me. I've had deacons take me out and they say, we're going to put you in a tree. Four, I'm 4 a.m. They're going to wake me up at 4 a.m. I'm up before Jesus and the Mexicans at 4 a.m. in the morning <laughs> and he's got me in a tree. Okay. That makes no sense. Is there nothing you can hunt about noon? Maybe that'd be a good time to hunt. And fishing, you do know that they've got fish at Kroger and at Winn-Dixie. It's just waiting for you there. And you can go to Brookshire's and it's wrapped. If you're hungry for hamburger, you don't go kill a cow. You go to where the hamburger's waiting. That's the lazy, city slicker side of me. And because I've pastored in country churches, I found myself in the field, 5 o'clock in the morning, with a burlap sack in my hands, yelling for snipe. And you are an evil man for laughing at that. If you ever wonder if anybody fell for it, I'm standing right here. They took me out. Now, preacher, they yell. When you yell, they come running, and you can just put them in the sack. So I'm bent over, freezing my blessed assurance off while they're going, <laughs> making noise in the woods, and I'm yelling, here, snipe, here, snipe, here, snipe. <laughs> you are evil people for laughing at that. All right, I see the crowd I'm in. Now, here's the good thing about the book of Ephesians. book of Ephesians is, in my estimation, the lit fire of the New Testament. I say that because Paul wrote four books while he was in jail during this period of time. Between 60 and 63, the guy's in, let's call it house arrest. He writes Philemon, he writes Colossians, he writes Ephesians, he writes Philippians, and, and 
Philemon and Philippians and Colossians and Ephesians. Of those four, Ephesians was the book that spread like wildfire. Now, the other one's caught up, but if you look at the early church, there were more quotes from this book under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that spread through the early church. Of the five centers of church, Rome and Jerusalem, Antioch, Alexandria, of these places where the, the church was just exploding, the leaders in those churches were going, man, let me show you something right here in the book of Ephesians. Here's why. Ephesians starts out by hitting doctrine. But it is the most plain spoken book in the New Testament. It is, in my estimation, Paul's simplest book, and that's why I think it's the best. Because what he does is he uses a few clues as to explaining why. He says, here's the doctrine, and now here's what you do. As a matter of fact, he does it in such a way that I want to show you something. On your own time, in your own study, look at the number of times in the book of Ephesians he uses the word therefore. Therefore or wherefore or since then. Because it means the same thing. It all comes from the same little Greek word called un. And that little Greek word, un, means here's why I'm telling you. And the best way that I can describe this, the best way I can illustrate this is my grandmama. My grandmother never learned a word of English. My grandmother did not get saved until she was 92 years old. She got saved and was baptized at the Friendship Baptist Church in McKinney, Texas. But there in that little church, before she passed away, she would start reading the Bible. She never learned English. My grandmother was five foot tall. She loved my wife. She could barely tolerate me. She could barely, she, the thing is, my grandmama would not fit in our counterculture 2019. I see you white people all the time negotiating with your kids at Walmart, talking to them before you walk in. Now, Tommy, Tommy, remember our magic word, grapefruit. Remember, if I say grapefruit, that means you stop touching things. Oh, goodness. If I ever touched anything in the store, my grandma didn't have time out. Yeah, she had knockout, she <laughs> blackout, <laughs> choke out. She knew she, she, grandma was tough, man. She'd hit you. To wake us up in the morning, you had two warnings. Ergun, my name Ergun. So she would say, Ergun, up, up, school and call so shut down talk it. Ergun, get up. First warning. Ergun, up, up, school and call so shut down talk it. By the second warning, she was beating me. And I don't mean tapping me lightly. I don't mean she was nudging me. She never nudged. She would say, don't make me turn my ring around. Do you all know that language? They got a ring. Some grandmamas have a ring. They turn it around and put the stone on the inside, pop you on the head. Now look, I got a lumpy skull to begin with. Your pastor is much better looking than I as bald. But those lumps were earned. They were earned. Paul had the same method. Every time in the book of Ephesians, he uses the word therefore. For instance, um, just for fun, Ephesians 2.11. Therefore, I want you to remember that you being in the past time were Gentiles in the flesh. 2.19. Therefore, now you are no longer strangers or foreigners, but you're fellow citizens with the saints. Uh, Ephesians 4.1. I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, beg you that you walk worthy. Every time the word therefore is saying, all right, here's what I told you, now listen. And when we get to Ephesians 5, there's these three little verses side by side. He gets done saying, I'm telling you, you are new creatures in the body of Christ. You are believers with Jesus. So let me give you my first caveat. I am not talking to you if you're, if you're a lost person. I, I hope you get saved. If you don't know Jesus, you need to. Because there's only one door, one chair, one path, one road. And that's him. And he doesn't share his throne with anybody. I say that because as a Muslim, we would say, oh, we respect Jesus. You can't respect Jesus. He said he was God. If he was God, he deserves more than respect. He deserves your heart. And if he wasn't God, he deserves your pity. Because we all know people who think they're God but ain't. So if he was who he said he was... 
Respect isn't enough. Well, we would say in our culture, what does our culture say? It says, it's all the same God. Let's all join hands, Muslims, Jews, Christians, Buddhists, Hindus, Sikhs, everybody, it's all the same God. We all worship the same. You know, it's a higher power. It's a divine spirit. Light a candle, sing the Coca-Cola theme song. Stupid. There is no other name under heaven by which man can be saved except the name of Jesus. So I didn't change teams. I didn't switch jerseys. I got saved. I went from worshiping a false, dead idol who is named Allah, invented by a man by the name of Muhammad, to knowing the only true, living, redeeming, resurrected and ascended and returning Lord. I am saved, sweetheart. Born again. And when he says this, he's speaking to mature Christians. Ephesians, he writes, he says, look, to those of us who should know better. So tonight, I'd like to speak on the topic of get up and don't be stupid. <laughs> Ephesians 5, beginning in verse 14. Well, I'll tell you what, we'll go back to 13 just to set the stage. He goes, all things that are not allowed, are reproved, are, are made manifest by the light, are shown by the light, are, are, are exposed by the light. For whatsoever you do is manifested in light. Thus, I'm telling you, or because you see this, I'm telling you, I'm explaining it to you. Wherefore, he says, awake thou that sleepest. You may have a translation that says, awake, O sleeper. But that was my grandmama. That was Paul saying, pay attention. You got one shot. He's talking about life and he's talking about this moment. He goes, knowing all this about God, knowing all this about what Jesus has done for us, he goes, awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead and Christ will give you light. The word for dead doesn't mean that you were dead in your sins. It actually means you've been asleep a while. You've been numbed to the truth. And if you hear the truth too often, you get too used to it. What's the biggest crime in the church? We've been saved so long we forgot what it was like to be lost. We've been saved so long we forgot what it was like to have no hope, no peace. And so he says, awaken you who have been numbed. He keeps going. Arise from the dead and Christ will give you life. See that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, don't be stupid, but as wise. And then he says, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. It's interesting because the word for days there is actually the word that means numbered days, counting days, countdown clock, if you will. And so in each single verse, verse 14, verse 15, verse 16, he lays it out for us, the simplest of practical truths. He goes from being tactical to being practical. He goes from being theological to now being very... Uh, unbelievably practical. He says, all right, here's what we know. Jesus Christ is Lord, Savior, God, and King. He's prophet, priest, and King. That Jesus Christ died, resurrected, and ascended so that you and I could have life, power, and forgiveness. That we have an intercessor for us at the right hand of the Father. That is, he is our advocate with the Father. He is standing with us. And here on earth and in you and I, we are temples of the Holy Spirit of God. So God the Father forgives, God the Son redeems, and God the Spirit fills. You want to see how that goes on? Look a little bit later in this chapter where he says, don't be drunk with wine, which is unto excess, but be you filled, continually filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Look, he lays it out and says, here's what's available for you if you just paid attention. He says, wherefore, awake, get up. That's number one. Get up, awake, and arise right there in that verse. It's not enough just to be conscious of it. But arise means to get up and do it. It's not enough to say, I know the truth. I have to live the truth. And that's how awake and arise work hand in hand. Get up, he says. Get up and get about your job. As we were driving here. By the way, there's very few places in Texas that are as beautiful as you guys. There's nothing. When I drive to Wichita Falls and I see these incredible on both sides, it's just beautiful. You all go to Abilene on 20, it's brown. You all go through Pat. When you get to Jacksboro, when you get to those hills, 
And I don't know why y'all got pinwheels up on the highway, but it, they're pretty pretty. I think this is amazing where you live. But being in the middle of pretty country isn't enough. You and I have a job to do. You've got breath in your body, there's hope for your soul. If you've got breath in your body, there's a job for you to do. It could be a hard job, it could be an easy job, but there is a job. As a matter of fact, let me call your attention to the word arise. Not just awake, but arise. It means to get up and get to work. The Anabaptists are our forefathers. We go back, the Anabaptists, to the 1500s. These were people who were not Protestants. They were not Lutheran. They were not Presbyterian. They were not Anglican. They were the hunted. They believed in the Bible alone. No book of common prayer, nobody else's catechism, just the Bible. They believed that if you were born again, you'd be baptized. No baptizing of babies. That's why they were called the Anabaptists. To become an Anabaptist, to confess Christ as Lord, and to get in the water as an adult, however, well, it meant you signed your death sentence. The average Anabaptist lived 18 months from their conversion. They were put to death in the most horrible of ways. They were lashed to crosses and burned. They were buried in the water because they said, well, you guys want to be baptized? We're going to baptize you for real. And so they drowned them. One man, as the flames lifted, his hands came loose, and instead of fighting to run away, he lifted up what was the first sign of the cross, which was, I love you in Christ, like this. And the last thing he did, as his body burned, it's an amazing thing. When the Anabaptists baptized, they didn't say, buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. You know what they said? They would say, tell us your testimony, and in the water, the person would share their testimony, and they would say, buried in the likeness of his death. Arise, O minister of God, to thy work. Every single one of us is a minister. Every single one of us. Man, woman, boy, and girl. You think you're too old to work? God called you to minister. You think you're too young? If you're born again, you've got a job to do. Arise. It's not just enough to be awake. Arise. Secondly, what's he say in the next verse? Arise and awake and then... See then that you walk circumspectly, carefully, with wisdom. Don't be stupid. Don't be foolish. Don't be dumb. I love this language. He doesn't use the beautiful term for ignorance. There's a beautiful Greek word for this. He doesn't use it. He uses the word to mean your brains have fallen out of your head. It means to be empty-headed, stupid, no brain. And I love this because they should know better. That's why he used this language. You should know better. To walk circumspectly, the word circumspectly means with wisdom. Here's the difference. For those of us who are believers, if you're a mature believer, here's the difference. It's one thing to have knowledge. It's an entirely different thing to have wisdom. Knowledge is just the accumulation of facts. Wisdom is the ability to use that knowledge. Look, I got five degrees. Five, Bachelor of Arts, Master of Arts, Master of Divinity, Master of Theology, and a Doctor of Theology. And I'm the dumbest person in this room. I'm absolutely certain, I'm telling you, looking you right in the eye. There is nobody in this room who is stupider than me. I, if you ever see me under a car, I've been hit. I can't fix anything on a car. Couldn't drive a straight nail, never painted a wall, don't know how to do any of that stuff. And I'm gloriously ignorant of these things. My wife can do all of it. Oh, but that brings me to wisdom. The best sermons I ever preached on marriage. I preached before I was married. Anybody else? Man, it's easy when it's all theory. You can get up in the pulpit and go, <clears throat> take your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Wives, submit! And you know in the Bible that means to love, honor, and fetch. Now I just shut up and sit in the corner with the rest of the guys. <laughs> I know less about women now than I did before I was married. Gentlemen, women may use the same vocabulary, but they don't use the same dictionary. If two women are in this room who are best friends, they can have an entire conversation and not use one dadgum word. Y'all will look at each other and go, 
And the other one will go, and we, just dull as a fence, just, what are you saying? Here's how you change the vocabulary. Gentlemen, if a woman uses a word twice, she's changed the meaning. Hey, are you two dating? Well, we're dating. We're just not dating, dating. You ain't dating. I like him. I just don't like him like him. She don't like you. You change the meaning. If you're in the middle of a fight with a man, ladies, all you got to do, all you got to do in the middle of the fight and go is, I'm so tired of fighting. Do you want to go make out? We're in. You could be calling our mama a name at that moment. You could be saying, your mama's a no good. We go, that's the meat. Yep, let's go. Come on, we're going to go kiss. Try it on a female. Once. Hey, you want to go make out? I will kill you. She will. If you're in the middle of a fight and she goes, fine, it does not mean fine. If you say, I'm going to go hang out with my buddies and say, yeah, I'm going to go, I'm, I'm done arguing with you. I'm going to go play with my buddies. And she says, go ahead. Mm. Yeah. Don't do it. It does not mean go ahead. It's a dare. She's daring you to try. She's going to change the locks once you're outside the door. She's going to load the gun and wait for you to come home. Well, that's the difference between knowledge and wisdom. See, I can read all the books on marriage and then get married. And you can burn those books as much as anybody else. The difference is the application of knowledge, not the accumulation of knowledge. That's what he was saying. You should know better. Maturity in Christ, growing in grace. That's how he closes out the book, too. He talks about you grow in grace. That happens when you begin to apply what you know. And wisdom is greater than just knowledge. All those degrees don't mean squat. I I used to hear one of my favorite preachers in the world, one of my all-time favorite preachers, who would tell the story of, you know, praying and then one day going into the presence of God. He'd say, I'd approach the Lord And I'd say, Lord, and he'd say, Doctor. Let me say his name. Lord ain't going to call you doctor. He's going to call you a dirty, low-down, good-for-nothing sinner saved by grace. He's going to look at you and see the blood of Christ. He's going to see the righteousness of Jesus. He's not going to see how smart you are. Matter of fact, smart makes dumb. The hardest people in the world to get on fire for Jesus are professors. Can you imagine what kind of dummies I deal with? Do you realize how hard it is to get somebody who thinks he's so smart? There's nothing more intelligent. You guys know this. There's nothing more intelligent than a first-year Bible college student who's read two books, got a John Piper quote, and he's ready to fight everybody. He knows it all. And all you got to do is just look at him and go, all right, he'll learn. Learn to walk circumspectly, he says. Get up, rise, get to work. Don't be dumb. Look at the next verse. He says, redeem the time. Check the clock. Are you starting to see how all this applies to a football analogy? Get to work. You win the games in practice, not on the field. You win the games when nobody else is practicing as hard as you. You want it worse, sometimes you play better. Get up. Get to work. Don't be stupid. Know your job. Watch the clock. Redeeming the time actually means to squeeze, to to squeeze out of it everything that you can possibly get. There's a limited amount of time here on glorious earth, a limited amount of time in what God has given us. I've had enough heart issues to just choke me. I don't even want to hear about it again. And you know what? I survived. You know why? I have no clue. I have no idea why others succumbed and I'm still here but I do know it means I've got a job to do. And so do you. You watch the clock just by paying attention. You watch the clock by doing what God has called you to do and enjoying it. Do you understand there's no greater joy than serving God? I get to do this for a living. I get to do my greatest joy, the thing that wakes me up in the mornings, to be able to do this 
It awakens me. It alivens me. It makes me excited. It gets me going. <coughs> Let me show you something. In the, in the last years, being in the hospital a lot and being in medical facilities a lot, I have seen more Dr. Phil than I ever care to see in my life. Every waiting room, Dr. Phil or Judge Judy. I think it's the same person. And every single time, I want to choke somebody. Can't stand it. When I go home, I don't watch those shows. When I go home, I'm all about my food network. I don't know if you are, but oh my. Open up a chopped basket, and it's got jello and steaks. And I'm thinking, okay, what are you going to do with this? I've tried. I don't know what it is, ladies. But Texas women, y'all can cook. And I mean cook. I cannot. I've tried to bake. I've made the nicest, beigest hockey pucks on God's earth. You could beat somebody to death with a sock full of them. I don't know how to do it. And the reason I don't know how to do it is because of you. Women, look right here. A smidge is not a measurement. But that's what y'all do to protect your recipes. I just put a smidge, a pinch. I don't even know what a pinch is. Oh, well, I need recipes. I needed to tell me a quarter cup of this. And this, my wife can cook. She's amazing. And she's from Indiana. All they have is corn. Then she can cook anything. But you guys do this. Oh, I just put a pinch. I just do it by feel. You are lying to us. You are mean. And you are hiding something from us. I don't know how to cook. If I wasted my time trying to set up a restaurant, nobody would come. You know why? It's not my calling. Find out your calling, and you're never going to work a day in your life. A job pays the bills, but your calling lights your fire. The calling is what gets you up in the Doing what you enjoy serving God. Doing something that affects eternity. Doing something that reaches somebody. Every single one of you who teach a Sunday school class. Every single one of you that work in kingdom kids. Everybody who passes out a bulletin. I got hands shook ten times walking in here. Y'all didn't even know who I was. But somebody turns on the lights. And somebody empties the diaper pail. And somebody makes sure the air conditioning's going. And somebody shakes the hand. And somebody sings the song. And for a moment, somebody's life is eternally changed. That's Christianity. Christianity was never designed, never meant, and never pictured by God to be boring, dry, stale, stagnant. Christianity was designed by God to be living and vital. And even in the midst of persecution, you rise. Even in the midst of trial, you awaken. The call of God is still as real as it was the day you got saved. And the work of God is still as exciting. And seeing somebody saved, and seeing a brother at the altar praying before we get started, and seeing you preparing, and seeing a pastor prepare to play the guitar, that is not fair. You shouldn't be able to preach and do instruments. That's like being pretty and smart. You can be smart or ugly, but you can't be both. Doing what God's called you to do, and doing it where God's called you to do, when you can line up the location and the vocation, whew, come on. And so I'll find myself in a tree at 4 a.m. in the morning. I'll find myself in a church in Dumas where they tortured me and fed me something that you should never feed another human being, something about oysters. You are so evil. <laughs> that just ain't right, bro. Should have written a book so that I would have known. But I'll do it. I don't care. I love what I get to do. Amen. Welcome to Christianity 101. Get up! Don't be stupid. Watch the clock. Lord Jesus, here's our prayer. If there's a brother or sister in this room, the fire's going down a little bit. The spark is not ignited. 
following you at a, at a distance because it just doesn't feel right. And it, Christianity's gotten a little boring, a little dry, a little stagnant. Oh, Father, reignite our passion. Stir up the gift of God within us. Make it living and alive once again. Give us a pulse and a passion. Give us the joy of our salvation. Give us a reason and an understanding that wisdom is greater than knowledge. And time is ticking. So in the limited amount of time that we've got left, in the, in the amount of time that we have here on earth, thank you, Lord Jesus, for giving us this shot, for giving us this opportunity, for giving us this, this, this reason for existence. Thank you. You didn't just save us to get us to heaven. You saved us to give us life here on earth too, abundant life. And you gave us a call and a passion. Oh, Father, nobody has no job. Everybody has some job. And you have called us, enlivened us, compelled us, launched us. Thank you, Lord. Awake and arise. Awake and arise. If there are brothers and sisters in this room who don't have that fire, bring them to the altar. And don't let them leave until you lit it again. Lord Jesus, awaken this church. Awaken my home church. Awaken the churches in America. We got a job to do and a time to do it. And that time is now. Redeeming the time because the days are evil and yet we are awake in jesus name we give you this invitation in jesus name we give you this moment amen stand the altar is open do what you got to do before god